Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Karen Von Hippel, uh, and I'd like to welcome you all to the 18th Land Warfare Conference, sponsored by RUSI in partnership with the British Army. I'm wondering if anyone here has been to all 18. Now, Colonel, <laughs> Colonel Hurley, anyone else? So we want to talk to anyone else if you've been here for that many. Um, I'd also like to extend a special welcome to the ministers uh, and senior officers from across UK Defence, as well as their counterparts, um, as well as the National Security Advisor. Welcome. As most of you know, RUSI has its roots in this country's armed forces, going all the way back to 1831 and our founder, the Duke of Wellington. Today, the study of military sciences is still central to what we do, and this really includes a range of activity from providing bespoke research to hosting study days for junior personnel. In fact, this year we're really proud to announce that we will be welcoming an Army Fellow at RUSI, and I think the CGS may touch on that this morning. Uh, I think the CGS would also agree that this conference has consistently played an important role for the Army. Uh, it provides a platform for engagement with external actors, with all of you, and uh, really our goal is the promotion of independent thinking about our collective security. The theme of this co year's conference, using land power decisively in an era of constant competition, has taken on added importance, uh, not just given the uncertainty faced in this country post-Brexit, but also globally as uh, we all face a range of, uh, of threats from state and non-state actors in both the virtual and the physical space. And I know we will be addressing many of these threats and issues today and tomorrow. Uh, in fact, I think it's safe to say that the British Army is today being asked to do far more, applying a wider array of tools in more complex situations with fewer soldiers. Uh, that being said, the Army will continue its transformation to address current and future threats, even in today's resource-constrained environment. Now, I know these challenges are not unique to the British Army, and I know many of the others here face similar challenges, and so we're delighted that we've been able to attract uh, so many from so many countries. We have 35 countries represented here today, uh, from Afghanistan to Zambia. And of course, uh, we also welcome our partners from industry. Um, at RUSI, we view these conferences not as one-off events, but rather as part of an iterative learning process, uh, whereby we really try to absorb the lessons learned from the previous year into the current conference. Uh, and we've already scheduled the date for next year, so mark your calendars, uh, 19, 20 June uh, in this space. Between now and then, we will be working with the Army, with industry, with academia, and the policy community to prepare thought papers, to hold debates and discussions, uh, and other events, so that next year's conference can capitalize on this learning. Uh, similar to last year, I think all of you would agree, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers and themes, and we will, the RUSI team and, and the Army will be doing all we can to encourage a lively discussion, hopefully not just on your app, but also raising your hands. Uh, before I introduce the CGS, I wanted to thank a few of our supporters. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Airbus, DXC Technology, Harris, L3, and Lockheed Martin UK. Uh, I'd like to thank them for their generous support, not just for the conference today, but also their support for our research. Second, I'd like to thank our longstanding partner, the Association of the US Army and General Swan, Welcome back. Uh, and third, of course, I'd like to thank the British Army, which has covered the cost for all of those in uniform today. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank the delegates for coming and for your support and for sharing your expertise today and tomorrow. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, General Sir Nicholas Carter, the Chief of the General Staff. As most of you know, General Sir Nicholas Carter is a professional head of the Army, he has responsibility for developing and generating military capability from an integrated army of regulars and reservists. He's also responsible for maintaining the fighting effectiveness, efficiency, and morale of the service. 
He was commissioned into the Royal Green Jackets in 1978 and has served in every conflict zone that you can think of, uh, including commands in Iraq and Afghanistan during really difficult times. He became Commander Land Forces in November 2013 and was appointed Chief of the General Staff in September 2014. He's also been a very good friend of RUSI. I think he's been participating in our events for over a decade and supporting us at RUSI in a number of ways. Uh, and I would say it's safe to say that he is one of the more innovative and strategic leaders on defense in this country, having literally designed today's army. So please join me in welcoming General Sir Nicholas Carter. Uh, Karen, thank you for those uh, kind remarks. Um, on behalf of the British Army, uh, welcome to this year's Land Warfare Conference. Um, we've assembled an impressive group of panellists, speakers and chair people this time, which is great to see. Particular thanks to RUSI, but also Guy to AUSA for all your support for this as well. But more importantly, thank you for all attending. Um, I have not seen this room as full in the last three or four years, so it's tremendous to see it packed to the gunnels. Let's hope we retain your interest over the course of the next couple of days. So this year, the subject of our conference is using land power decisively in an era of constant competition. This description, I think, recognises that the security environment is increasingly complex and dynamic. Indeed, the defining characteristic seems to be one of instability. The international rules-based architecture that has assured our global security, stability and indeed prosperity since World War II seems to be increasingly challenged. And the pervasiveness of information is driving an ever-evolving character of conflict. And our rivals are taking advantage of this. They're using new tools to seek advantage. They exploit ambiguity and the blurring of the distinction, perhaps, between peace and war. And that, I think, is a challenge for us who are exponents of land power. It's interesting, even, I think, paradoxical, that the value of land power in this context is increasingly questioned. And the lessons that some have drawn from the campaigns of the last decade or so is that land power simply leads to unsuccessful and expensive entanglements. So the purpose of this conference is to think hard about the utility of land power in this new context, with a focus on four themes. Information and warfare, information and people, how we should fight and how we should train. What are the continuities? What is genuinely unprecedented in this new context? And what is relevant that we can learn from historical parallels. Our starting point, it seems to me, is that we must understand the sort of war we're in, ideally before we enter it, which means being clear, amongst other things, about who our adversary is. And adversaries can be rivals or opponents. They're not the same, as Syria certainly shows us. And this is where the British Army's new core doctrine of integrated action is so relevant. Because what it seeks to do is to get after this conundrum. It requires commanders now to analyse the broader audience, not just simply the enemy. And in so doing, to work out what effect they need to impart on that broader audience. And then the best mix of soft through to hard power to achieve that effect, to achieve their outcome. That requires innovation. It requires first principle thought. And while experience is, of course, valuable, military officers do have a tendency to fight the last war. And there is that old proverb, isn't there, about there's only one thing harder than getting the new idea into a military mind, it's getting the old one out of it. So understanding that land power must be used, and used within an effective political strategy, and I think our engagement in Afghanistan reinforces this point. Did we ever own the in-country political strategy? Where there was local political alignment, progress was made, and one saw that in places like Kandahar. But at the national level, there are question marks, surely, about whether we had the confidence that our political strategy was aligned 
despite all of our financial and military leverage. So I hope that during the next couple of days, we'll get after some of the following questions. First and foremost, how do we use land power in a smart way to avoid the perceived risk of entanglement? How do we wield influence, the increasing idea of beside, with and through in relation to indigenous forces, which is the idea behind our new specialised infantry battalions, which are designed to garner insight and understanding, but also to shape and set conditions for a more intelligent response if we have to intervene at greater scale? How, using counter IED language, do we get ahead of the bang? What capabilities are needed to prevent the bang from happening, or indeed when it does happen, to reduce its lethality? E.g. cyber, electronic, um, electromagnetic activity, uh, the media, uh, our own 77 brigade, and the whole idea of information manoeuvre, perhaps in parenthesis. How do we secure the right talent to do this imaginatively? How do we educate commanders to play their part as producers in an amphitheatre, as Rupert Smith described it? How do we get smarter at messaging and communicating? What sort of hard power do we need to underpin all this? And how does this play into modern deterrence in this era of constant competition? Mass is still important, but at what scale and how, in our cases, do we mitigate a lack of it? The British Army has not been smaller in regular terms since the days of Cromwell. So the notion of a whole force of regular reserves, and indeed regular reserves, a potential mobilised force in our case of maybe 150,000, with more if you add contractors to it, is probably what is needed as we expand quickly to deliver manpower to the point of need. The importance of multinational interoperability. Our systems must be extrovert, not introvert. We need to be able to plug in on the day. And we need to reinforce this idea, I suspect, of beside, with and through in terms of our ability to operate with indigenous forces. I think we need to think hard about how we preserve our combat power. Can we utilize ISR and fires to fight a more decisive deep battle that is more at arm's length so that our maneuver, in a sense, is about firing to maneuver? It's inevitable, I suspect, that the battlefield will be more decentralized. So what are the force structural and capability implications in terms of task organisation at lower levels. And in doing so, we need to retain the ability to mass quickly, to concentrate and to centralise. And of course, history teaches us, I suspect, that battles tend to be won at reinforced company level. What does this mean for the development of junior leaders? How are they trained to understand the possibilities of a much broader range of capabilities? How do we prepare to fight the war we might have to fight? Because in so doing, there's a sporting chance that we might deter it from ever happening. And how do we mobilise something that our great-grandfathers understood? General Henry Wilson would have got that entirely in 1913 and 1914. Training now, increasingly, I sense, needs to be viewed as surrogate warfare. It needs to be about generating a combat ethos because absent the sort of battlefield that Afghanistan provided for us, it's the training that delivers the fighting spirit necessary to succeed. But it also has to provide the laboratory or the catalyst for force and capability development. Again, battlefields provide that for you. So absent a battlefield, how does our training do it for you? And I think also our training needs to be visible, because the point you make, either to potential allies or to potential opponents through your training, clearly has to be visible. How do we overcome our dependency on air and compensate for our reducing advantage? And perhaps, absolutely the highest priority perhaps at the moment, how do we mitigate the inevitable lack of resources? Critical if one wants to be able to aim off for a much broader range of threats. So the idea of technology demonstrators that are on the shelf ready to go might be a solution. And the watchwords, I guess, now are increasingly about productivity, efficiency, and prosperity. And that, I guess, I will come back to later on in this conference. And the last point, which I think bears reflection on at the moment, 
is how do we, as land power, secure the trust and understanding of the population at home? This is going to be vital in terms of how we sustain ourselves, but also to give us the license to operate and the license to be used, which of course is what all young men and women do and want to do when they join an army. So there is much to think about, and I look forward to your active participation and the answers to these questions during the course of the next couple of days. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm William Hague. I'm the former Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom and also Chair of the Royal United Services Institute. And I join in the warm welcome to you all, particularly people from other countries who have come here this morning. We have an extraordinary range of speakers and participants uh, to take part throughout this uh, conference about using land power decisively in an era of constant competition and as you've heard uh, the first two sessions including this one are going to look at what are the drivers of change with subsequent sessions uh, looking at what are the agents of change in this situation. Um, I reiterate some of what you heard about the, um, the housekeeping here this morning. This is meant to be interactive based on what we call RUSI rules. Uh, the prepared remarks that you are about to hear are on the record but the discussion is off the record so you can ask about anything you like and hopefully you will use the technology to do that. I have an iPad here in front of me on which your questions should appear and I will be very disappointed uh, if they don't so uh, please take part. Um, I was very conscious as Foreign Secretary for a little over four years of this era of constant competition, of, of being in a systemically less stable world than we had become used to. Uh, that is the result of the increased flows of information, of a more multipolar world, of rapid demographic change. We are about to see a doubling of the population of Middle Eastern countries in the next 30 years, uh, for instance. Compared to the period at the end of the Cold War, uh, we have less stability, we have more constraints on many of our countries, countries that are more deeply in debt or more politically divided uh, than they were 20 or so years ago. We see a more interconnected international environment, the connections of markets and of populations that have migrated. Um, and we see much stronger non-state actors than we used to see. They may be criminal networks, they may be terrorist organizations, they may be transnational businesses, they may be non-governmental organizations with very good intentions, uh, but there are much stronger non-state actors uh, than there were even 20 years ago. So we are in this less stable world. I feel that it, the, the the arrival of much less stability coincided with my arrival as Foreign Secretary in the UK in 2010. I once went on a tour of uh, Lebanon, Syria, Bahrain, Libya, um, and one or two other countries, and the Prime Minister, Prime Minister David Cameron said to me, the only thing all these countries have got in common that have revolutions starting is that you've just visited them. Uh, is it you that's causing it? Well, it wasn't me that's causing it, it was all these other factors that I'm talking about, but it has gathered pace uh, over, the, over the last few years. And we have seen in that environment that where the West holds back or pulls back, others move in, uh, whether it be Russia in Syria um, or the growth of a, of a terrorist state in Syria and Iraq that much effort has now had to go in um, to um, extinguishing or almost extinguishing. So we have to think about what is the role of land power in those situations. Um, we have seen a, an increased, um, much increased discussion about cyber attack um, and great investment in this country in being able to prevent cyber attack. Uh, 
Um, when is a cyber attack an act of war? At what level does it become an act of war? And again, what is the role of different um, uh, arms of the military in uh, responding to that? Uh, we've seen new forms of warfare, of course, which I experienced in my time as Foreign Secretary uh, in the Crimea and in eastern Ukraine, the use of soldiers out of uniform uh, and accompanied by social media and conventional media operations uh, alongside them. So there's much to think about in this developing era of constant competition, including the historical precedents and including how uh, governments uh, organize themselves to respond to this and how they think about using land power in the future. And so we have three very distinguished speakers to take part in this session before we have uh, questions and discussion. Uh, we have Mark Sedwell here. We have Professor Hugh Strawn and Professor Elliot Cohen. I'll introduce them all uh, one by one just very briefly. And first of all, we'll turn to Mark Sedwell. I don't really need to read anything about him because I know him very well. Um, I first knew him when he was British ambassador in Kabul, and he went on to be political director at the Foreign Office when I was Foreign Secretary, and then was stolen from the Foreign Office by prime ministerial order uh, to become permanent Under Secretary of State at the Home Office, where he did such outstanding work for one Home Secretary, Theresa May, that now that she is Prime Minister, he's there as the National Security Advisor uh, in 10 Downing Street. So an absolutely central figure in the security thinking uh, of the United Kingdom. Um, and Mark, uh, we're looking forward to your remarks before I introduce the other panelists. Well, William, thank you uh, very much. Good to be here, um, and uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, in terms of the opening remarks, it's been said uh, already, really, um, so I'm afraid you're not going to hear anything very new from me that you haven't just heard from William, from Karen, and indeed from, uh, from Nick Carter uh, as well, with whom I served uh, in Afghanistan. Um, when I look at our national security challenges as a country, of course, one has to look at it through the lens of our relationships in the world, and uh, the threats that we face. So let me just uh, run through some of those issues. The first thing to say is that I think almost every generation contemplates the threat picture that they face and concludes that it's getting worse. Now that could just be all of us uh, putting our midlife crises onto the table as we hit that stage in our uh, careers. There's sometimes a bit of that. Um, but inevitably, because we focus on things, we focus on what is changing and we think very, very hard about the threats. But it is just worth uh, keeping in mind the overall context. We do not face the kind of existential threat to, uh, the, to, to the survival of this country that we face for most of the 20th uh, century. And it's just worth uh, keeping that in mind. Of course, there are uh, countries out there with the potential to present that kind of uh, threat uh, to us, but we don't face it in the same immediate way we did uh, for much of the 20th century. And therefore, as we've already heard in this era, the national security picture that we face is defined less by the level of threat and more by the level of complexity uh, that we face. And, and you've heard that already. The blending of state and non-state threats. Uh, uh, the uh, blending of the techniques and tools that they use. Uh, militias being uh, used in Ukraine and Crimea out of uniform. Not so different to the use of Hezbollah uh, in the Middle East by Iran to support uh, the Assad regime, not very different um, to uh, the use of irregular forces uh, elsewhere. You see uh, hybrid uh, warfare uh, running uh, across all uh, what I think we now have to think of as six battle spaces. Uh, we, we're used to thinking of land, uh, sea and air as the traditional battle spaces, but there are now three more. There's space, there's cyberspace, and it's a slightly glib way of putting it, but there's headspace as well. Uh, because an awful lot of the effort of our opponents is aimed at the, uh, the thinking, the psychology of our populations and of uh, impressionable people within them. And I will come back to uh, that point uh, in a moment. And we're not the only people thinking about this. At a conference about five years ago, similar to this, although probably not quite as on the record, um, General Gerasimov, uh, Nick's uh, counterpart in, uh, uh, in Russia, set out something that has become the continuum doctrine. 
uh, and that is essentially about the use of all forms of state power in support of uh, Russian, in that case, but the state's national security agenda, running through the traditional military uh, assets but into cyber, propaganda, uh, uh, influence operations, uh, and so on. We see that as aggressive, and when you look at the way it presents itself in Ukraine, uh, in many of the countries uh, 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 neighbouring Russia in the, former, uh, in the former Soviet Union, if you were from the Baltic states or from Eastern Europe, you will see uh, the, the, the way that that doctrine plays out is pretty aggressive. It isn't the way it's seen by General Gerasimov or the Russians. They see it as fundamentally defensive. And it's just worth remembering as we contemplate some of the threats that the perspective that we have and the perspective of our opponents um, or, and indeed some of our rivals, is not the same. Uh, we used to think during the Cold War of containment as essentially the approach we took from the late 40s and the long telegram and so on uh, of the Soviet Union. They saw it as encirclement. And that doctrine uh, and that perspective remains absolutely central to their worldview. If you sit in Moscow, you look at a boundary of influence that has moved towards you several hundred miles in the last 25 years, and if you were holding this conference there, that would be your preoccupation. And how do you prevent that boundary of influence coming still closer and threatening your homeland? Uh, and how do you reassert your influence in uh, the near abroad? I'm not suggesting, by the way, any uh, particularly uh, good or bad moral or immoral approach to this. I think that is just simply uh, what a rational view of the strategic interests seen from the perspective of, of in that case, our main uh, strategic uh, competitor um, uh, uh, is something we need to keep in mind. That said, however, um, the national security threats uh, that we face, uh, we have to deal with this complexity uh, because we face acute as well as strategic threats. In our national security strategy in 2015, which we're currently having a refresh of, um, the top threat that we uh, uh, are tackling is the terrorist threat. Now, there are many people and there are many on the uh, parliamentary committee that scrutinises national security that say we overdo that and that we should focus more on the strategic uh, threats, even though they are in a modern uh, guise from Russia, from China, uh, from other uh, main powers in the world, whether or not they are uh, aligned uh, to, us or, to us or not. And China, of course, is a country with which we have a strong relationship and are seeking to build huge uh, opportunities, but it is also a rising power with great uh, military capabilities. But if you're a political leader, you can't ignore the acute threat, and the acute threat is the one that, as we've seen in the past few weeks, will kill our own citizens on our own soil and is more likely to do so than uh, the strategic uh, national threats. Uh, the way we're approaching that is uh, largely to deal with it within our own communities. We have to deal with uh, pockets of safe space, ungoverned space, if you like, at home, online, but as well overseas. And this is where the military uh, component uh, comes to play. The, the, th the, the threats to the UK... Uh, the terrorist threats to the UK emerge from Syria, Iraq, from Afghanistan and Pakistan, from Yemen, from Libya, and other uh, sources of conflict. They are not classic projections of threat um, from those regions. They are projections through cyberspace into the hearts and minds, largely, of uh, some parts uh, of our own community. But nevertheless, it, it is important that we deal with the problems at source uh, uh, and we deal with the foreign fighters uh, who, are, uh, who are there because it is those people who are radicalising people here uh, in the UK. And so those, uh, uh, those conflicts, as we found in Afghanistan, will have to be dealt with through the traditional mix. Uh, we need military force in order to suppress the immediate security threat. We need uh, a, 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 an effort to indigenise government so they can do more of this for themselves and create um, uh, state institutions to which people will feel some kind of sense of uh, affiliation and identity, and we need a political strategy uh, to deal with the underlying grievances, not that cause the terrorist threat or the insurgent threat, but which they uh, exploit. And that's true in northwest Iraq, it's true in Afghanistan, it's true in Yemen, it's true in Libya, uh, it's true uh, in all of them. And of course, uh, the army land power has an important part to play uh, in dealing with those threats. We also have an important part to play in dealing with that, uh, that broad spectrum strategic uh, threat and we have to respond with a full spectrum approach of our own. We are not going to start deploying militias out of uniform. So uh, uh, we're not uh, going to start assassinating our opponents on the streets of foreign capitals. So we are not going to deploy uh, 
the same range of capabilities of some of our, uh, some of our opponents, but we do have capabilities, uh, in particular in the soft power uh, area, uh, that are uh, a great deal more profound than theirs and which they fear. If you look back to the Gerasimov, the original Gerasimov address, he talked about the color revolutions, the orange revolution, etc., etc., um, in uh, what Russia regarded as their traditional sphere of influence and set those out as essentially prompted by Western action. Now, I'm sure William and I, uh, when we've been doing this, would think to ourselves, well, you know, how do we do that then? Uh, because our ability to stimulate popular revolutions in other countries is clearly uh, uh, somewhat constrained, but it is interesting that it is that soft power that is most on the minds of some of our, uh, some of our strategic uh, competitors. So when I think about national security capabilities, I think of the traditional three Ds, defense, obviously land power, uh, a, a central part of that, uh, diplomacy, um, and our, our big uh, development uh, commitment. We're the only country in the G20 uh, that meets both the 2% and the 0.7% uh, targets. But we also need to think of some capabilities that the national security community are not used to thinking about in the same way. There's a whole range of control mechanisms that actually I became more familiar with when I was running the Home Office. Border controls, criminal investigations, uh, smart sanctions, um, uh, going after uh, the, the money and the, uh, uh, that, that sustains regimes that depend on corruption and criminal patronage networks. Uh, there's a whole range of activity that, uh, some of which we did during the Cold War, but we've lost some of the facilities to do in terms of communications. We do it very well, actually, in dealing with radicalization online. We need to think about that set of techniques uh, more broadly. We have huge third party, commercial and other assets, who are an important part of an open country's projection of influence um, uh, over, uh, uh, overseas. And of course, we have world-class uh, covert capabilities uh, as well. And so when I look at the defense capabilities that we need in this, in this modern era, it is going to have to be broad spectrum and it's going to have to be highly agile. And land forces have an important part to play in that. We have to maintain the strategic deterrent. Uh, we have to be able to deliver precision effect in places like Syria, like Afghanistan, to deal with those immediate and uh, imminent uh, threats uh, from terrorist groups. And we have to have a, uh, an all-force expeditionary capability that enables us to participate in major Western coalition operations to deal with uh, a country that's collapsed or deal with, for example, support a, a small ally that is threatened by a large and assertive uh, regional, uh, regional power. And so when I look at the tests that we will apply and that if I'm taking advice to the Prime Minister, to the National Security Council, there are uh, just a few that I'll be applying and that I think uh, will be of some interest to you. First, what is the British core national interest? That needs to incorporate the interests of our allies, um, the views of our opponents and the activities of our opponents. It needs to incorporate our values internationally, but fundamentally we need to take a really clear view of what is the British national interest. What do we really care about a particular issue or problem set. Um, second, uh, uh, what's the situation and what's the outlook? We spend too much time in government um, forgetting that oldest military rule, no plan survives first contact uh, with the enemy. And so we need to think more creatively about not only the policies that we set out in public as our objectives, usually world peace at the risk of sounding like a Miss World contestant, um, but also what are, the, what are the situations we absolutely need to avoid and what, are the, and what is the outcome we can live with? We didn't do that in Afghanistan for a very long time and we didn't do it in Iraq. Um, uh, we didn't really bring that intellectual rigor. What could we have lived with as an outcome in those countries, say, over a five to ten year period? And it wasn't some of the more ambitious, uh, slightly starry-eyed um, uh, rhetoric uh, that we heard. And that is challenging to achieve in a democracy because to maintain public consent, you often have to talk about uh, a much more aspirational set of goals. But unless you're prepared to resource them, then you have to uh, think about a minimum acceptable uh, outcome. Um, third, um, uh, uh, what, is, what would a comprehensive Western strategic plan, not strategy, strategic plan with resources that we can bring to bear uh, look like? What does that strategy look like? In the UK, we should always have a view on that doesn't mean we're going to be the choreographer of it or the impresario, but we should always have a view. We're a major uh, player in the world. We should always have our own view on that in order to influence others. And then and only then do we, should we start asking ourselves 
what is the UK contribution to that? What is the catalytic contribution that we can bring um, as part of that full spectrum set of capabilities to enable that overall Western approach uh, to happen, to make a contribution to it and to influence its outcome? And we need to walk through those tests quite quickly and regularly as we deal with the range of national security threats uh, that we face. So when I'm talking to Nick and to uh, uh, Stu Peach and the other leaders of our uh, defence establishment, that's the perspective I'm hoping that they will bring. What, what can and what, I, want, what I, want, I look forward to hearing from this conference is what capability in that complex world, a world where we need to be both expeditionary and defensive, where we need precision tools and broad spectrum tools, uh, where we've got to deal with the traditional strategic nation-based threat, but one that uses non-state techniques, uh, and, and one uh, and a threat that uh, can reach right into our own communities and subvert the minds of impressionable youngsters. By the way, a threat that my great predecessor, Sir Francis Walsingham, would have recognised 450, 500 uh, years ago. It's not that new. But how do we deal with those things in the modern era, and what can uh, land power bring to bear to enable us to resolve them? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mark. You've raised some important questions there. I hope we can return to this, um, to many of the issues you've raised in our discussion, including this uh, uh, point about the, a comprehensive Western plan, which would be an interesting thing to discuss. And we're now fortunate to be able to add to Mark's remarks the remarks of two uh, very uh, senior academic uh, speakers, uh, starting with Professor Hugh Strawn, who's... Um, uh, who's already there at the lecture. He's had an extraordinarily distinguished academic career, uh, Professor of International Relations at St. Andrews University. He has long served as a Professor of War at Oxford University. He's one of the greatest experts on the First World War. He's also written a biography of Clausewitz and on the direction of war. It would be hard to have a more appropriate speaker here. So, Professor Strawn, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, my brief today is to take a historical look at the idea of constant competition in the hope that it might provide some insights to inform our discussion over the next two days. Let me make two pretty obvious preliminary observations. The first is that many would say that constant competition in the international system is itself a constant, that states are continually jockeying for position and not infrequently threaten or even use force as they do so. The only reason that the idea should command our attention now is that within Europe, but not in the rest of the world, many states since 1990 have become extraordinarily complacent about their comparative security. Um, and as the National Security Advisor has just reminded us, uh, essentially uh, our position remains by the sands of the 20th century an extraordinarily secure one, as indeed it does for much of Western Europe for all the concerns about terrorism. Um, I'll repeat a point I think some of you may have heard me make before, which is that during the long 19th century, 1815 to 1914, Britain came to regard uh, that period as a long peace, uh, and indeed became so accustomed to the idea that many in 1914 found it hard as indeed many on the European continent itself, to take seriously the possibility of major war. Uh, Freud had a wonderful remark uh, after the outbreak of war uh, to the effect that he could not believe that European civilized states were doing this to each other, um, something, of course, that would strike us in exactly similar terms today. Moreover, although the British Army only once fought what we would today call a peer competitor in that century, in the Crimea, of course, not inappropriately, uh, barely a year passed in which it was not fighting somewhere else in the world. So, in other words, long peace didn't mean peace for everybody. Uh, secondly, the second point, is that the value of history lies not in examining case studies for parallels. Quite frankly, such exercises are fool's errands. Uh, they encourage selectivity and argument which strip away too much context and too many variables. The value 
that lies in history is its capacity to generate understanding, to distinguish real change from continuity, and to appreciate the play of probability and chance. We remain locked in our conviction that our comfortable forms of existence will continue without change. And yet, when we look at the past, we focus on moments of dramatic change, on 1914, or 1939, or 1941, if you're American or Russian, or 1989, or 2001. US politicians have been telling Europeans for some time that NATO members need to meet the spending target of 2% of GNP, but for some reason we're surprised when a president actually tells us to do it. Uh, did we really conduct a Brexit referendum in 2016 in the belief that it would simply confirm the status quo? And if so, why the hell have a referendum? In both cases, our fixation with the status quo leaves us shocked even by the consequences of our actions or of our laziness even when threatened with change. History should prompt questions of our current predicaments so that we challenge our own presumptions and our group think. If we don't ask the right questions, we sure as hell won't get the right answers. And too often we ask the questions which are couched in the terms in which we want to find the answers uh, rather than ask the questions the White Ray Riot. They predetermine the answers we want to hear. If Britain goes to war today or in the near future, it will do so as a member of an alliance. We don't have the capacity to act alone in almost all the possible scenarios that confront us. That was true even in 1914 and in 1939, and it is even more true in 2017. A national strategy may help us to shape national policy, but it tells us next to nothing about how we shall fight a war because we almost certainly won't do it nationally. This year, we have passed the halfway point in our commemoration of the centenary of the First World War. As a First World War centenarian, I have to say, I'm pretty glad we've reached that point. Uh, in 2017, we have marked the battles of Arras and Messines, and we're about to mark the Third Battle of Ypres, which culminated on the Passchendaele Ridge uh, in October, November 1917. But these events, however firmly etched in our national consciousness, were entirely secondary to the major geopolitical shifts of 1917 in terms of alliances. Shifts which did far more to determine how and when the war ended. In March 1917, Russia went through the first of two revolutions. An active Eastern Front disintegrated in the course of the year, a process completed in November with the Bolshevik Revolution. Two weeks after the first Russian Revolution, on the 6th of April 1917, the United States entered the war on the side of the Allies. Neither event was a complete surprise, but both profoundly changed the course of the First World War and did so with lasting effects throughout the 20th century. Quite frankly, both events matter far more than the battles whose centenaries we are actually commemorating and had far greater effects. In June 1917, as a result of these changes, it was reasonable and possible for the first time since the outbreak of the First World War to anticipate with relative confidence the possibility of an Allied victory and when it might be achieved. The United States was, after all, even then, the world's largest industrial power, and it will be able to send four million men to Europe by 1919. Although both events shaped the world in the 20th century, neither Russia nor the United States has shown much interest in their commemoration. In 2017, President Putin I'm told, and President Putin, I'm told, is going to say, as my predecessor, Peter the Great, used to remark. Um, in other words, he stresses continuity in Russian history, tracing links back to Tsarist Russia, despite the Bol Bolsheviks' determination to break with the past. Uh, Putin, in other words, is not terribly interested in the events of 1917, uh, and there doesn't seem much sign that Russia is going to mark them. But he is at least aware of Russia's history and of its power 
in determining national identity. Uh, it's one area where military history really seems to get a following. President Trump's grasp of U.S. history can seem somewhat shakier, uh, but in respect to the U.S. role in the First World War, he is not alone. For most Americans, the First World War remains a forgotten war. In 1917, the United States had a Democrat in the, in the Oval Office, but one who in 1915 had declared his policy was America first and who had proved deeply reluctant both to involve his country in European affairs and to wage war. Nonetheless, he did so, forced by circumstances which commanded uh, the eventual assent of Congress and of the US people, and which brought the new world to the rescue of the old. In the first half of the 20th century, it was the contingencies of war itself that shaped and solidified alliances, which were either tentative or non-existent before the outbreak of war. For many in Britain before 1914, an alliance with Tsarist Russia was anathema. Its domestic policies were repellent to liberals and Labour, and Labour members, uh, in other words, the parliamentary majority, and its foreign policy presented a challenge to Britain in India and East Asia. After 1917, an alliance with communism was equally abhorrent to British politicians, specifically Winston Churchill. It required another war to reconnect Britain with Russia, just as it required another war to reconnect the United States to Europe after the Senate had refused to ratify the peace settlement in 1919. So what can we say about the role of alliances in the causation and conduct of war on the basis of those earlier expectations? First point, the alliances of 1914 and of 1939 were constructed above all with the purposes of deterrence in mind. Before both world wars, France in particular needed an ally in the East to counter the latent power of Germany on its land frontier. Although Britain was complicit in this deterrence, it was not the core alliance between major powers, sorry, although Britain was complicit in this deterrence, it was not the core alliances between major powers which triggered war. In both the world wars, war in Europe was triggered less by great power ambition and great power rivalry than by lesser powers triggering those rivalries amb and ambitions. Serbia and then Belgium in 1914 and the Czechs and then the Poles in 1939. Chamberlain may have spoken in 1939 about going to war for a faraway land of which we know little, but it was the second time in 25 years that Britain had done that, had gone to war in a conflict that originated in Eastern Europe, not in Western Europe, countries in which Britain's interests seemed peripheral and minimal. The then Manchester Guardian, as it was called, took the view on the 29th of July 1914 that if it were physically possible for Serbia to be towed out to sea and sunk, the air of Europe would at once seem cleaner. Uh, and on the following day it added, Englishmen are not the guardians of Serbian well-being or even of the peace of Europe. Their first duty is to England and to the peace of England. And of course Scotland's included there. Five days later, Britain would be at war with Germany as a result of a struggle between Serbia and Austria-Hungary. Put in today's context, our vulnerability to open conflict lies less in areas where commitments are robust and explicit and more in areas where lesser powers have the capacity to tweak the tails of bigger ones. It seems to me that in 2017, I'm going to chance my arm here, the United States and China have little interest in forcing a climatic battle between themselves for the control of the Western Pacific, however much war games may play with that scenario, and perhaps precisely because they do address that scenario. But the US is much more vulnerable to the capacity of its allies in those seas, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines and Taiwan, to call into play America's great power credentials in scenarios not necessarily of America's own choosing. 
In Europe, NATO's vulnerabilities lie in areas of ambiguity in Ukraine and the Balkans rather than areas of clear de declaratory intent covered by the provisions of Article 5, such as the Baltic states. The presumption that the great powers necessarily call the shots in alliances is deeply flawed. Somewhat more surprisingly, it may also not help us when we address the conduct of war itself. So let me say a few words, if I've still got time, about the conduct of war itself in alliances. The US has created a narrative in relation to alliance behaviour that relies on junior allies, including, of course, Britain, to confirm uh, and consolidate its direction and presumes that is how alliances perform best. In Britain, we have increasingly fallen into step with that expectation. In reality, there is little concrete evidence to support this presumption. Britain did not follow the US into Vietnam. Would we follow the US into war in China or into Korea? The US's principal ally in Vietnam, the government in Saigon, did not conform to Washington's bidding any more than have the governments in Iraq or Afghanistan done so. And indeed, many other partners since 1945 have failed to follow US bidding. Once the US has attached its status and prestige to a lesser partner and so become dependent on the lesser partner's success, that lesser partner calls the shots as much as, as or more than the US itself. Again, the First World War can be instructive. The First World War ended with a coalition victory won by an alliance of roughly equal powers. In 1914, France had the most effective army, Britain the biggest navy, and Russia the manpower. By 1918, France, Britain, and the US uh, fielded armies which were all roughly equivalent in size. The responsibilities of each ally were different in important ways, but the function of the alliance depended on the contribution of each which generated a rough equality of status. That point was true of the Second World War too, albeit in a different way. By 1945, the big players were self-evidently the United States and the Soviet Union. By then, the United Kingdom was weakening in terms of manpower, resources, and as Churchill became increasingly infirm, leadership. But both Churchill and the United Kingdom retained the authority from having been in the war since 1939, not just since 1941, and from having, at least in the rhetoric of 1940, stood alone. So what does this tell us about the functioning of alliances today? Since 1990, NATO has not faced an existential threat as the alliances of 1914 and 1939 did. Paradoxically, however, NATO responded to the removal of the existential threat which brought it into being by expanding at the end of the Cold War for political reasons more than military ones it became an alliance of democratic powers struggling to find strategic purpose. That was one reason why in 2006, NATO presented its commitment to Afghanistan in life or death terms. NATO was going to war, but out of area, and it was a test of military and operational capabilities as opposed to its commitment to deterrence and to the prevention of war. Over a decade on, NATO has abandoned the existential vocabulary it used to describe its commitment to Afghanistan in 2006. Existential, in other words, not for Afghanistan's survival, but for NATO's survival. So when, as it does, it describes its success in Afghanistan, it is referring to the fact that NATO itself is still in business. NATO has not failed in Afghanistan, but nor has it succeeded. Its abilities are not in fact political. Each member of an now expanded alliance has a different set of political objectives depending on its relative geographical position in relation to Russia, its exposure to terrorism and to uh, Mediterranean migration. NATO's success as an alliance is underpinned by its strength at the operational level and by the ability of its constituent armed forces to plan and to fight together manifested, of course, by the attendance this morning. As a result, it has increasingly fallen back 
on common concepts of warfare to ensure convergence, however vague and variously defined, of which hybrid warfare or grey zone warfare stand as examples. They become so vague in some interpretations as to be meaningless. If actually what you mean by hybrid warfare is Russia, why the hell not say so? Crucially, NATO's post-1990 operations have not been wars of national survival. Powers have contributed forces to immediate coalition crises, principally for reasons of long-term national strategy, to ensure that they earn favours in future from their allies and from the United States in particular. And as a result, contingent commanders have reported to their own governments have been subject to national caveats and to different rules of engagement. Of course, national difference, differences have been central to coalitions in the major wars of the past. But in major wars, military necessity forces convergence, trumping the political pressures for divergence. The wars in Afghanistan and even in Libya highlight a further point of friction the issue of geographical distance, which we also tend to gloss over. The further away that from the theatre of operations the participating country is, the more those wars become wars of choice, not wars of necessity. Consider the implications of Article 5. If the most obvious danger of major war in today's world lies in the Pacific and is likely to involve the United States and China, where does that leave the United States as European allies? Are we ready to defend California? What are our plans in the event of war on the Korean Peninsula? Are we in Britain as ready to go to war in countries in Eastern, not Western Europe, as our predecessors were in 1914 or 1939? Steve Walt's account of alliances in the Middle East and the Cold War is instructive here. Egypt, Israel and other players uh, were ready to take arms and advice from their major Cold War partners, the United States and the Soviet Union. But their policies in practice followed regional priorities and were set by regional considerations and regional en enmities. War, if we take the example of the two world wars, brings alliances to life, gives them direction and purpose, and above all, aligns the long-term vision of a national strategy developed in peace with the short-term competitiveness and the immediate contingencies of making operational decisions in the heat of battle. We are totally unprepared for this. We confront challenges to two core relationships. First, that between the United States and the United Kingdom, as the latter not only pivots to Asia, but raises doubts about its commitment to NATO's Article 5 and that, of course, between the United Kingdom and Europe following Brexit. We may protest, indeed we genuinely mean, I think, that we wish to remain committed to European security as we were before the Brexit vote. But Angela Merkel's Germany and President Macron's France are now impelled by increasing doubts about NATO's utility and look to specifically European solutions. In a long interview with The Guardian last week, Macron spoke of the importance of Britain's defence and security relationship with Europe and France in particular, but he did not once mention NATO. His predecessor said France was at war after the 2015 attacks, but called on Europe, not on NATO, by citing the Lisbon Treaty. And we in Britain are not sure where we stand geographically, where we might go to war and who will be our allies in those circumstances. The 2015 National Security Strategy set up as its aspiration the Joint Task Force 2025 with a carrier group, a deployable division, I do wonder where the ARC is in this, um, and the appropriate air assets. This is essentially the 1998 Strategic Defence Review revived, a commitment to expeditionary warfare. But the Prime Minister, when she went to visit Donald Trump soon after his election, said the days of British and American Britain and America intervening in sovereign countries in an attempt to remake the world in our own image are over. That may or may not be so, 
But as we confront a vacuum in northern Iraq and northern Syria, and competitive regional strategies conducted by the areas, states in the area uh, endeavour to fill that vacuum, then once again we confront the issue of how we relate genuine operational solutions to hard political choices, hard political choices that we struggle to confront. Thank you very much. In the hopes of uh, triggering discussion, let me throw out four propositions which seem to me to be true about both politics and the nature of military means, our strategic context. The first is simply the pervasiveness of war. A lecture comparable to Sir Michael's would have to be entitled, Not Military Science in an Age of Peace, but Military Science in an Age of Chronic War. Not competition, but war. Together, our armed forces, the American and the British, have been waging war for over 16 years in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in chronic low-level conflicts around the globe. This means, among other things, that our armed forces are incessantly busy. Constantly operational as they are, it has become increasingly difficult to find the leisure to reflect on their profession that made such soldier scholars as your Michael Carver or our John Galvin. Inevitably, the armed forces of our time are likely to promote those officers who have shone in the wars of our time. And it will take some time to remind ourselves that the wars of the next 15 or 20 years may actually look quite different than those of the previous 15. One of the more trenchant parts of Michael Howard's uh, article, uh, which is often quoted, but I'll, I'll uh, drag it out again, is where he says, and I quote, I'm tempted to declare dogmatically that whatever doctrine the armed forces are working on now, they have it wrong. <laughs> I'm also tempted to declare that it does not matter that they've got it wrong. What does matter is their capacity to get it right quickly when the moment arrives. He then goes on to say that this shouldn't encourage intellectual laziness. And he concludes by saying it is the task of military science in an age of peace to prevent the doctrines from being too badly wrong. And I think that's not, that's not a bad uh, tasking to give oneself. I think it's important as well to realize that although we have officers now with an extraordinary range of combat experience and having acquired skills and traits which will stand them in good stead in the future, they have also undoubtedly picked up others which are counterproductive. And it is not clear to me that the mindset that worked most effectively in Hellman, for example, would be the right one if NATO finds itself in a showdown with Russia over one of the Baltic states. So military science in an age of chronic war. Secondly, it seems to me war today has multiple roots. In the 1970s, people believed, correctly or not, that ideology was the prime driver of conflict. Ideologies of national liberation or socialism most notably. Today, one has to say that war arises out of a far more varied set of causes. Religious fervor, revanchism, revisionism by states at odds with the liberal order that we have known, the collapse of political order and attempts to restore or to create it. Sir Michael noted in his essay the problematic quality of the term, the science of war. He was, and luckily still is, too wise an historian to accept the connotations of rationality and knowability that those words implied. But today, even more than then, it is clear that one cannot reduce warfare simply to matters of technique. The multiple roots of conflict imply multiple strategic challenges. And I would say, particularly as an American, uh, as I think about it, the United States faces very, very distinct strategic challenges. First, the rise of China, which has already uh, been referenced which is perhaps not the greatest challenge for the United States Army, but is an enormous challenge for our other services. Secondly, the continuing conflict with violent jihadists in the Middle East, but just about everywhere else, including the homeland. Dangerous states like Russia, Iran, and North Korea, who are also willing to use force, sometimes in subtle ways and sometimes not in subtle ways, to transform regional politics. <clears throat> 
And finally, the growth of ungoverned spaces and challenge to the great commons of humanity from the high seas to failed states, from outer space to cyberspace. For us, speaking as an American, and I think in some measure for you as well, this means not only a requirement for very different kinds of forces, but for the ability to think in very different time scales and indeed to think about strategy very differently. In other words, part of the challenge of the future is developing officers who are capable of multiple modes of strategic thought. And indeed, since I don't actually believe in omnicompetent general officers, this is going to be a particular challenge, I think, for the United States going ahead. We are going to be facing very, very different kinds of conflicts which require very different kinds of people. And it will be a particular challenge, I believe, for our civilian leadership to understand that and recognize that as they make the big decisions uh, about putting people in charge of wars. A third proposition is that war is at once more remote from citizens than it has been in the, uh, the year of uh, 1977, and yet closer to them than ever before. One thing that has struck me in, uh, just in the past couple of years is really the disappearance of the living memory of the Second World War which was so present when I first came to uh, RUSI. And here I think I may end up disagreeing somewhat with my colleagues on this panel. The end of the living memory of World War II means with it, I think, a diminished sense of the possibility of disaster, real disaster. Our conception of disaster is 9-11 and in no way deprecating the loss of life and uh, the damage that that did, that is not real disaster. Losing a city is a lot closer to a disaster. Wars which could inflict much higher casualties than anything that we've thought about, that is much more like disaster. And again, to some extent, unlike my colleagues on the panel, perhaps because I have greater faith in uh, human willfulness, blundering, misunderstanding, and sheer stupidity, it is not at all clear to me that we will not end up blundering into major conflicts which bear with them the possibility of real disaster. I would also make a more mundane point about that shift from the mid-1970s to today. In the 1970s, the memory of compulsory military service was fresh, even in the UK, which had abandoned uh, a draft well before the United States had. Even as the first all-volunteer forces were created, moreover, armies remained, relatively speaking, quite large, and the military presence in society very visible. Today, however, armies are increasingly small, highly specialized, and composed of something that looks increasingly like a hereditary caste of the children of soldiers. Thus, politicians who describe themselves or their fellow citizens as war-weary usually do so without having had a single family member or close friend who's actually borne the burden of the fight, let alone been wounded or killed in combat. And yet, in a different way, war is much closer than it was. In the suicide bomber's blast, in the fusillade of bullets from an active shooter, in cyber attacks, in the immediate coverage of war zones by news organizations as well as freelancers and social media as divergent as the BBC and Facebook. Uh, and that, I think, also is a, a critical point of long-term importance because all this is happening in an environment where in our societies the fundamental consensus about things like NATO uh, no longer exist. And that's also part of the strategic context that bears thinking about. Finally, the tools of war have changed as well. Now, uh, that's obviously true when we talk about technology, and the people in this room know a lot more about it than I do, but I want to make three subordinate points. The first is, and in a way I'm teeing off uh, General Carter's observation at the very beginning, we no longer have mobilization-oriented militaries, by which I mean, uh, obviously our militaries all have reservists, they all can call upon contractors, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. In the past, and in the United States, this was really essential to our thinking about defense 
going back to even, indeed, even in some ways to the colonial era, the understanding was that once you got into a war, you had to generate new forms of military power, which may have only existed in embryonic forms before the conflict, and you had to generate it rapidly. That four million man uh, army that the United States sent to Europe by 1919 was coming off a base of something like about 120,000 in 1917. It's quite extraordinary, and an army that was not prepared for European warfare. This is not the way our defense organizations function. It's in many ways not, it's not the way I think our officers think. Um, not clear to me that it's wise that we are that way, but it is the way we are. Secondly, we have armed forces that do routinely reach across domains. A world in which submarine-launched cruise missiles can deliver a blow against an air defense system 100 or 200 miles away. We've entered an era, as you all know, of routine precision, information-rich systems of command, and ubiquitous unmanned systems. In such a world, the old World War II metaphors don't apply. And perhaps most importantly of all, and I think this is one that really bears deep reflection, we have entered an era in which the technological superiority of Western forces, which in a way was just beginning to open up in the 1970s, was just beginning to become manifest, just how much of a technological edge we had on all of our potential opponents, including the Soviet Union, that can no longer be taken for granted. I won't try your patience beyond this other than to say that geopolitics, technology, and the disturbed domestic politics of the early 21st century make this one of the most intellectually challenging times I can imagine for professional officers. Michael Howard concluded his essay by saying that officers should, and I quote, see themselves as intelligent surf riders spotting the essential currents on which to ride in the sea, which is certainly disturbed and by no means friendly, but on which, if they are skillful enough, they will survive. Well, that was true of military science in an age of peace. It seems to me it's uh, even more true of military science in an age of constant war, chronic war, because I don't think that those seas are getting any friendlier, and I don't think the, comp the currents are going to be any easier to spot, just the reverse, than they ever were before. Thank you.